everyone. So this is lecture one of Biochemistry 101. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about cell structure and organelles. So a lot of biochemistry courses will put some of the introductory basics for cell structure and for basic organelle structure, um, usually or eukaryotic organelles, uh, into their courses, mostly because, I mean, we need to understand where the biochemical processes that we're going to talk about where those actually occur and so understanding you know basic cell structure is really really important so i'm going to try and talk about that today uh, but first things first we need to talk a little bit about cell theory because we're talking about cells right and biochemistry occurs within cells so we need to talk the basics of cell theory is just that living things are made of cells cells are the basic unit of living things and that they can only come from other cells so that can be eukaryotes, so that's mostly what we'll be talking about today is big, giant animal cells. Or we can have prokaryotes, which is an archaic term. We'll talk about that on the next slide. Uh, but think bacteria uh, when you think of that. Now, uh, I have a nice video and it has a really nice synopsis of cell theory and some of the, uh, the important people behind cell theory. <laughs> One of the great things about science is that when scientists make a discovery, it's not always in a prescribed manner, as in only in a laboratory under strict settings with white lab coats and all sorts of neat science gizmos that go beep. In reality, the events and people involved in some of the major scientific discoveries are as weird and varied as they get. My case in point, the weird history of the cell theory. There are three parts to the cell theory. One, all organisms are composed of one or more cells. Two, the cell is the basic unit of structure and organization in organisms. And three, all cells come from pre-existing cells. To be honest, this all sounds incredibly boring until you dig a little deeper into how the world of microscopic organisms and this theory came to be. It all started in the early 1600s in the Netherlands, where a spectacle maker named Zacharias Janssen is said to have come up with the first compound microscope, along with the first telescope. Both claims are often disputed, as apparently he wasn't the only bored guy with a ton of glass lenses to play with at the time. Despite this, the microscope soon became a hot item that every naturalist or scientist at the time wanted to play with, making it much like the iPad of its day. One such person was a fellow Dutchman by the name of Anton von Leeuwenhoek, who heard about these microscope doohickeys, and instead of going out and buying one, he decided to make his own. And it was a strange little contraption indeed, as it looked more like a tiny paddle the size of a sunglass lens. If he had stuck two together, it probably would have made a wicked set of sunglasses that you couldn't see much out of. Anywho, once Leeuwenhoek had his microscope ready, he went to town looking at anything and everything he could with him, including the gunk on his teeth. Yes, you heard right. He actually discovered bacteria by looking at dental scrapings, which when you keep in mind that people didn't brush their teeth much, if at all, back then, he must have had a lovely bunch of bacteria to look at. When he wrote about his discovery, he didn't call them bacteria as we know them today, but he called them animacules because they looked like little animals to him. While Leeuwenhoek was staring at his teeth gunk, he was also sending letters to a scientific colleague in England by the name of Robert Hooke. Hooke was a guy who really loved all aspects of science, so he dabbled in a little bit of everything, including physics, chemistry, and biology. Thus it is Hooke who we can thank for the term the cell, as he was looking at a piece of cork under his microscope, and the little chambers he saw reminded him of cells, or the rooms monks slept in in their monasteries. Think college dorm rooms, but without the TVs, computers, and really annoying roommates. Hook was something of an underappreciated scientist of his day, something he brought upon himself as he made the mistake of locking horns with one of the most famous scientists ever, Sir Isaac Newton. Remember when I said Hook dabbled in many different fields? Well, after Newton published a groundbreaking book on how planets move due to gravity, Hook made the claim that Newton had been inspired by Hook's work in physics. Newton, to say the least, did not like that, which sparked a tense relationship between the two that lasted even after Hook died as quite a bit of Hooke's research, as well as his only portrait, was misplaced due to Newton. Much of it was rediscovered, thankfully, after Newton's time, but not his portrait, as sadly no one knows what Robert Hooke looked like. 
Fast forward to the 1800s, where two German scientists discovered something that today we might find rather obvious, but helped tie together what we now know as the cell theory. The first scientist was Matthias Schleiden, a botanist who liked to study plants under a microscope. From his years of studying different plant species, it finally dawned on him that every single plant he had looked at were all made of cells. At the same time, on the other end of Germany was Theodor Schwann, a scientist who not only studied slides of animal cells under the microscope and got a special type of nerve cell named after him, but also invented rebreathers for firefighters and had a kick in pair of sideburns. After studying animal cells for a while, he too came to the conclusion that all animals were made of cells. Immediately, he reached out via snail mail, as Twitter had yet to be invented, to other scientists working in the same field, and it was Schleiden who got back to him, and the two started working on the beginnings of the cell theory. A bone of contention arose between them, as for the last part of the cell theory, that cells come from pre-existing cells, Schleiden didn't exactly subscribe to that thought, as he swore cells came from free cell formation, where they just kind of spontaneously crystallized into existence. That's when another scientist, named Rudolf Virchow, stepped in with research showing that cells did come from other cells. Research that was actually, hmm, how to put it, borrowed without permission from a Jewish scientist by the name of Robert Ramack, which led to two more feuding scientists. Thus, from teeth gunk to torquing off Newton, crystallization to swan cells, the cell theory came to be an important part of biology today. Some things we know about science today may seem boring, but how we came to know them is incredibly fascinating. So if something bores you, dig deeper. It's probably got a really weird story behind it somewhere. So prokaryotic cells, I want to just touch on a little bit because mostly what we're going to be talking about are eukaryotic cells. So prokaryote, uh, that term gets thrown around all the time. It's actually kind of an archaic term. We don't typically use that anymore. Uh, that was a term for non-nucleated cells. Uh, but we can lump bacteria or archaea, which are two separate divisions that we have into that division. So I, I kind of grew up with that term, so I use it a lot. Um, I try and teach my students not to use it, but hey, let's be honest, it's much easier to just say prokaryote because you just, anything small that doesn't have a nucleus or membrane bound organelles, <laughs> that's a prokaryote. Uh, but really what you're usually talking about are bacteria. Because um, archaea, we don't typically talk about them that much, to be honest. But relatively simple. As far as organelles go, um, so I say relatively simple. So that is a huge caveat. I put relatively, I hate putting quotes around stuff, but it's relatively simple. So that is a sarcastic set of quotes. Bacteria are some of the most complicated organisms on the planet that do processes that we can't even begin to comprehend yet. Uh, but we do understand a lot about them, and compared to an animal cell, a lot of the processes are at least slightly similar, or slightly simpler, uh, at least structurally. Maybe biochemically, they're not necessarily sim similar. <sighs> I keep saying similar. Simpler, but they can be, we can consider them a little simpler, you know, at least as far as organelles go. They usually lack membrane-bound organelles. So what, what do I mean by a membrane? I mean a phospholipid bilayer. That's what I mean when I say membrane. They're usually missing that um, in their organelles. They, of course, they have a plasma membrane that's literally right here in front of me. Uh, there's a nice plasma membrane. They will usually have a cell wall, and sometimes they'll have a capsule on, on outside of that. Uh, but they don't have membrane-bound organelles. So you can see uh, every now and then you can find a bacteria that might have sort of a vesicle-y looking thing. Uh, but for the most part, they don't usually have membrane-bound organelles. They do have their own. I mean, bacteria are basically the size of a mitochondria, so they're really small, so to have a membrane, I, it just doesn't really work out. Uh, so they don't have mitochondria, they don't have nuclei, they don't have endoplasmic reticulum. That's not to say that they're necessarily simple, they're just simpler, at least they don't have membrane-bound organelles. They're usually single cells, um, and they usually have a cell wall. So prokaryotes, uh, term you're not supposed to use. Now, eukaryotes, that's animals, plants, funguses, all those things, bugs, whatever you want. They're usually bigger. Right? So um, uh, typically coli might be, eh, let's say like the size of this mitochondria or this vesicle down here. So much bigger cell. Uh, they have membrane bound organelles. Uh, now there are other organelles that we consider organelles that aren't membrane bound. 
Okay, so they could be membrane bound, they could be not membrane bound. Some people will say that ribosomes are organelles. I would argue that they're not necessarily organelles. Um, but for the most part, eukaryotic cells do have a ton of membrane bound organelles, which is great because it lets them kind of distinguish, uh, it delineates things. It lets us have compartments to do specific things within. In a prokaryote, you don't have these specific compartments. So a lot of times you have to figure out a way to like separate stuff and keep them apart. But in cells like eukaryotes, we can just have a plasma membrane and it keeps things separate. So you got your mitochondria, keeps things, you could do mitochondria things. You can have a vesicle that does things. You can have your Golgi that does things. Um, you can have your nucleus to store your DNA because you have so many more proteins that you need to make. You got a ton of DNA to make all those proteins, so you need to keep them nice and separate. So you got this nice nucleus. We're going to go through each of these. Uh, eukaryotes can be single celled though, just like prokaryotes. They can also have a cell wall. Um, they also have a cell membrane. There are a ton of similarities between prokaryotic cells like bacteria, archaea, as well as eukaryotes. Um, single-celled, uh, you can definitely have single-celled eukaryotes, but we do have multicellular. I mean, I am a multi multicellular eukaryotic organism. But um, for the most part, we're not going to focus on individual uh, organism eukaryotic cells. We're just going to kind of take a generic smattering of all the organelles and just see what they look like. Um, so organelles in a eukaryotic cell, that means a little organ. Okay? Organelles, like an organ, and then, you know, organelles. It's the small one. They're little organs. It's Latin. Uh, all biochemical processes occur within and around organelles. So that's why we're focusing on this. We need to understand what a mitochondria is, what a lysosome is, what the nucleus is, if we're going to talk about the biochemical processes that occur in these locations. Okay? So I'm going to start at the nucleus, and we're going to move our way out until we encounter some of these other guys, and then we'll be done. Okay? So it's starting with the nucleus. Most people know it's the storage compartment for your DNA. Uh, it has a bunch of functions, so it's you're going to make your RNA there. Basically all your RNA. You're going to make your messenger RNA, you're going to make your ribosomal RNA, you're going to make your transfer RNA. If you take a genetics course, we'll talk about that more, but we're also going to talk about that in this course as well. Um, the nucleus itself has a double membrane, so that is not a single phospholipid bilayer, bi meaning two, okay? it's two phospholipid bilayers, there's two of them. Okay, so it's a double membrane, and you have these nuclear pores that dot along it. Um, so there's this picture. I tried to grab a few pictures that actually show different aspects of each organelle. Uh, so in this case, the actual picture of this nucleus is really nice, but I want to pick a, another one here that looks cool. Um, but you can see the nuclear pores here. If you take a cell biology course, like one of, I also teach cell biology, so you can look for those videos. Um, uh, we will go into more depth about the nucleus itself and the structure of the nucleus. Um, the structure of the nuclear pores, how to actually get things in and out of a nucleus is really, really important and really interesting. Uh, the nucleus itself has sub-compartments. That's something we don't typically talk about. And that's why this is an upper level biology course slash chemistry course. And we're going to talk a little bit more about those things. So um, cell biology course will focus more on those things. Um, but in this case, I do need to mention, so like the nucleolus, um, that's where you're going to make uh, chunks for your ribosomes, because your ribosomes are actually comprised of protein and RNA. Um, so that's basically the function of the nucleolus. But there's other subcompartments as well. The main job of the nucleus is to store DNA. Um, and I picked this picture. Uh, it's not the highest quality picture here, but I do like it because it's emphasizing two things that I wanted to mention heterochromatin versus euchromatin. I don't like those terms, but I do want you to be exposed to them. So chromatin is your DNA plus the proteins that give structure to your DNA. So your histones, there's a few of those. Um, and we'll talk more about that when we actually talk about uh, the process of replication and how things are organized. And if you take a genetics course, which I have videos here for genetics as well, um, heterochromatin is when it's nice and condensed down. Uh, and it's you don't have as much transcription because all those histones, those proteins that are the scaffolding for your DNA are really squished together. And if you start to loosen those up, we start to call that euchromatin. It, it's an old school way of looking at it. It's basically how it looked at under a, how it looked under a microscope. Um, I don't really love that term. I like to say it condensed chromatin versus loose chromatin. Uh, that just helps students understand what's going on. Um, anywho, but I like this one because it kind of shows the difference, like hetero, it's like really dense, so it's like dark 
and not dark green, but it's green here, it's really dense. And then the U chromatin is like a little looser here. And then they have a ton of empty space. So, so it's denser on the outside and then kind of loose on the inside where you're actually making messenger RNA. Now there's a few key processes uh, that we will talk about later. Replication, meaning making more DNA. Transcription, making RNA. And then you can also modify your nucleic acids. And so in what I'm really meaning there is um, either with your DNA, you can methylate your DNA, you can acetylate your histones, um, which I know those aren't nucleic acids, but they're part of that process. Uh, you can do RNA uh, splicing, you can cut RNAs, uh, you have to cap them, you got to tail them, all kinds of stuff that all happens inside the nucleus. Now, that's not just willy-nilly happening everywhere. I mentioned this earlier, there's subcompartments. So the nucleolus is the big one. That's the one that people have usually heard of is the nucleolus. There are a bunch of other ones. The nucleolus is responsible for making ribosomes, but there's a bunch of other ones. Uh, I have a list. If you take cell biology with me, we go through this in depth and talk more about these other ones. So I just grabbed a few. Um, this is a really interesting paper that you can go and read that talks. Uh, it's a little old, honestly, but um, you can read about all these different processes. So all the things that happen inside a nucleus, we want to keep them isolated because they're, we use specific enzymes, specific proteins to do these processes. And so we need to keep them isolated because we don't want them messing with each other and getting mixed up. So it's actually very, very organized. Sometimes cells seem a little chaotic, but it's actually really, really well orchestrated. Uh, a few of those Kajal bodies. So if you have really small RNAs, which, most messenger RNAs are actually pretty big, but we use uh, smaller pieces of RNAs to do things, a, a variety of things, uh, RNA interference, small interfering RNA. Um, and so when you need to make those or get rid of them, that's what happens in Kajal bodies, which I don't think they actually look like little red strings, but hey, whatever. Um, speckles is where we start splicing. So if you need to take your messenger RNA transcript and cut out chunks of it, Right? That's where you can, you have the factors that actually do that. So factors meaning like enzymes, uh, and that happens in speckles, nuclear speckles, which I don't think they look like peas, but hey, you know, whatever. Uh, and then there's paraspeckles, which I bet you they discovered though, they can, somebody probably discovered they, this thing, hey, it looks like speckles, but it's a little different. So we'll call them paraspeckles. And that's where you do some more RNA editing. You regulate your messenger RNAs, tons of processes that we're not going to go into right now. Um, PML bodies, so you gotta fix your DNA sometimes. Um, why wouldn't you store those things in a specific spot? You know, if you need to do transcription, hey, let's keep my RNA polymerases in one specific location so I'm, they're easier to find and use. And we also need to defend ourselves against viruses. Something that comes up a lot, and um, I'm sort of a virologist, and so uh, that actually will probably come up a lot in this course. Um, defending your nucleus against viral attack is really, really important. If it's a DNA virus or an RNA virus that's becoming uh, that's entering the nucleus. You know, if it's not, then, you know, who cares? Uh, so moving on, talked about the nucleolus and out of the nucleolus are going to come ribosomes. A lot of times we lump ribosomes into organelles. It's arguable if they are an organelle or not. They're really more a giant enzyme. Uh, we call them ribozymes. Their job is to translate. So they take uh, the messenger RNA transcript that we created inside the nucleus that gets exported out, if you're a eukaryote, gets exported out and it binds into here. So here's our ribosome. It's got two units. It's got the big piece and the little piece, large subunit, small subunit. These sizes actually vary. Um, S is sedimentation. Um, it's a substitute for mass, if you will. Uh, it's not exactly the same, but it has to do with how it's sediment. Uh, how the sediment layers occur. It, it's fine. It's just a substitute for mass. Um, so we got a big unit, small subunit, and then sandwiched in between them is our messenger RNA. So the messenger RNA actually kind of binds into the lower piece, and then you add new amino acids to the um, uh, these chunks within uh, chunks, these sections within the active sites of the ribosome. Um, it's not just made of protein. That's an important concept to get through. Um, it's made of proteins as well as RNA, and it's engaging in translation. So I wanted to, something to emphasize as we talk biochemically about what's happening. Um, here is a space-filling model. It's actually kind of a cross-sectional space-filling model of a ribosome. Okay, so there's our large subunit, small subunit. So there's our large subunit, small subunit. This is still 50 and 30S. Um, 
our transfer RNAs are what bridge the gap between our messenger RNA. There's a little messenger RNA there. It's kind of sneaking through there. And then along come our tRNAs, which have amino acids attached on the end. And they're going to bind into the active site, which is something that uh, in the next couple of lectures, I will be talking more about active sites and enzymes and the thermodynamics that are involved with actually causing processes to occur. And this is one of those processes. So the idea of an active site is really important. And the ribosome is a really great, simple way to look at an active site. An active site is where stuff is going to happen. It's where you're going to actually do something chemically. And so in this case, why I'm zooming in here, so we have our API sites. So, so API, is that right? Yeah, APE, sorry. Uh, EPA is how I used to learn it, or APE uh, the other way. So EPA. So we've got our E site, our P site, our A site. A site is where it attaches. I wanted to emphasize a, a one specific site. So a lot of enzymes, a lot, all the enzymes, they'll have an active site. That's where it's actually going to do its chemical job. And in this case, here we've got our messenger RNA along here. Now, if you want to read actually more about what this is specifically talking about, it's talking about how we actually terminate translation, hence translation termination, a kink formation of the actual messenger RNA and how that happens. Uh, they talk about it in this publication. But what I wanted to emphasize here, it, within this active site, that it's performing something chemically. It's actually you know changing how the RNA is oriented. How that occurs at the active site, uh, it has... Um, a variety of uh, amino acid side chains that have specific charges or lack specific charges, but there's also typically cations. And so in this case, we've got some magnesium ions here within the active site. And that's a consistent uh, through line that we're going to see in active sites is the presence of cations or anions, oftentimes cations, um, and charges within the active site to basically kind of hold things in place. Um, yeah, so that you can do stuff to different things. So moving on. So the rough ER, we're, uh, sorry, we're going to move into the endomembrane system. And so, um, which the rough ER is part of that. So the endomembrane system is just a series of membranes that we're going to use to uh, change molecules. Usually we're thinking about proteins in this context. Uh, the lipids can also go through here. Uh, it's just a series of phospholipid bilayers uh, that are continuous with the nucleus and head all the way on out to the cell membrane. So we're going to start at the nucleus and we're going to head on out. So actually making proteins um, is going to occur and actually modifying the proteins here is going through this endomembrane system. Okay? Uh, there's all kinds of processes that happen here though. So not just um, uh, we're going to make proteins so we can translate, we can fold the proteins, we can modify the proteins, we can degrade the proteins, we can export the proteins, and all of that is going to happen within the endomembrane system. Uh, and so I'm going to just kind of take us through that. Starting with the endoplasmic reticulum, there are two levels of the ER that we've uh, that you've probably heard of. So um, the rough ER has ribosomes on it, the smooth ER does not. They are often separated. So when you make, just kind of think about it, you make a ribosome that's going to translate uh, a messenger RNA into an amino acid chain. You make those ribosomes within the nucleus. So why would I export them way out in the middle of nowhere? I'm going to keep them nice and close. And so I'm going to have them nice and close to this endomembrane system. So the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, they're going to bind. Uh, they're not necessarily always bound. Um, they're Typically, they're not bound, and then they receive a messenger RNA that has a signaling uh, molecule or peptide or a signaling sequence that tells them to then go bind to the ER, and then that's where we actually see the protein get pushed into the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, but there's also the smooth ER, which does not have the bound ribosomes. They don't normally look this different. This is just to kind of emphasize that we kind of separate them. And this comes from scientists really, we try and delineate things really well. Like, okay, this is where X happens and this is where Y happens and there's no crossover. But uh, something that you'll learn as you dig deeper and deeper and deeper into biology is that there's crossover all over the place. Uh, something important to realize here too, uh, the nucleus itself, which has that double fossil the bilayer, is continuous with the ER itself. It's this one continuous endomembrane system. Very, 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 very cool. Now, I want to talk a little bit, just here's an electron micrograph. We've got the smooth ER, so you can see here. Uh, so this is just a cross-sectional 
um, electron microscopy picture. So you freeze it, shatter it, cut it, um, and you got this smooth ER over here, and then we've got a rough ER along these fossil. These are so these are fossil lipid bilayers, um, and then these are ribosomes that are actually attached to it. So that's how we're delineating rough ER versus smooth ER. Um, I have this picture right here. It's a uh, GIF, so I have it here. Um, so uh, in the actual slide set, you can see it playing, um, but I have it so it doesn't play, so I can actually type things on here. And so the what I want to emphasize here is that here's our ribosome. It actually comes along. This is the messenger RNA here. These are tRNAs that are coming in, and these are accurate-looking space filling models. And on the other end of the um, tRNAs is a amino acid. And each time an amino acid comes in here, so the E P the the <laughs> A P E sites, which I mentioned with the ribosomes, and you can see every time we're tacking on a new amino acid, and it's slowly making this peptide that's going to then go into the ER. So this is a bound ribosome. There are unbound ribosomes. They're just free floating is what they're often called uh, within the cytoplasm of the cell. And they're free floating. So they're, if you want your amino acid to just kind of hang out around there, go for it. Then it can just do that. But if I want to secrete it or have it embedded within the plasma membrane, well, then I'm going to go through this process. And it's a really interesting process. Uh, notice here we've got our ribosome in blue. There's our messenger RNA, so it's cruising along that messenger RNA. And there's a sequence that's going to basically tell it to go and bind to the endoplasmic reticulum and kind of squirt it into there. And then you can mess with stuff. So you can cut off that little sequence. And then this is uh, in the yellow here is my new protein that I'm making. So it's going to get modified. So I can throw carbs on there. I can attach some lipids onto there. I can put all kinds of stuff. Uh, onto my protein. Um, now here's a concept I want to emphasize. If I want that protein to just eventually get secreted out of the cell, so let's say this is some kind of protein hormone, and I want to secrete a bunch of it out in, outside the cell into the rest of the body. Awesome. Then this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to cleave it here. It's just going to kind of float inside this vesicle here, which we'll talk about in a minute. And, and then that can just go form up with the cell uh, plasma membrane, and then it gets squirted out. But what if you didn't do the cleavage here? So it wasn't separate here and see how it's kind of stuck between the membrane here? What if I, instead of cutting it here, I just left it embedded within the membrane? Ah, that's how we get proteins embedded within the membrane. So there's all kinds of proteins that we actually embed in the cell membrane. So transporters, um, other things. <laughs> transporters is the most obvious one. Uh, channels to get stuff through. And so as we do that, um, that's how you would do that. So th this is really, really important. So if you want to put some kind of protein on the surface of your cell to actually signal to the rest of the cells nearby what's going on, then this is how you're gonna do it. So it's really, really important. Uh, here's a cool picture, endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, these guys um, from FSU, they have a really cool set of pictures uh, from these, uh, I think they're kidney cells or something, but they take a lot of um, really cool fluorescent pictures. And, uh, this is just a cool one where uh, blue is the nucleus, so it's a hooks, hookst stain. Um, that's how you pronounce it, hook, hookst. I had to look it up. Uh, so it's blue. And then in green, uh, they used uh, phylloidin with GFP, I believe, to uh, stain the cytoskeleton. So remember that cells have a skeleton themselves, which it's usually just a bunch of proteins, either microtubulins and actin, cytoskeleton structures that form uh, some of the shape of the cell, like give it some structure. Because you gotta, you don't want things just floating around willy-nilly, you want to be able to move them around. So you have a little skeleton there. So they use GFP against phloidin, or phloidin to bind to it that has GFP on it, and concavalin, which is uh, a protein for the endoplasmic reticulum, usually. And so uh, in red is the ER. And so you can see the nucleus going to the ER. The ER is everywhere. Uh, it's just Full, the whole cell is full of endoplasmic reticulum. So it's not just this willy-nilly organelle that sometimes we use. Like Honestly, most of your proteins are probably going to go through the ER uh, because you got to move around and put them in membrane, membranes and they're doing all kinds of stuff. Now, we usually have the Golgi apparatus next. The Golgi apparatus is an interesting thing. So uh, a lot of times when we simplify these processes, what we say is that uh, you go from the nucleus to the ER to the Golgi to a vesicle and then out. Now, it's, that's an oversimplification. So the Golgi apparatus itself is really a place where we modify either proteins or lipids. And so oftentimes what we're doing is we're going to take uh, functional molecules or functional groups like phosphates 
or sugars, and we're going to stick them onto proteins or carbs. Uh, I'm sorry, or lipids. And so if I want to make a phospholipid that I'm then going to use to do something, that's going to happen in the Golgi. If I'm going to take... Oh god, that was so annoying. Uh, if I'm going to take a protein and I need to make it a, um, a glycoprotein, so I'm going to add some kind of sugar onto it, which there's tons of different sugars that we can add, and um, disaccharides and polysaccharides that we can stick onto proteins, um, that's going to, I'm so sorry, that's going to also occur in the Golgi apparatus. And so on the next slide, I have a cool picture here of, uh, in here, this is a Golgi body or Golgi apparatus. Kind of depends on uh, where you took this or what year you took this in high school. Um, I was called a Golgi apparatus. Um, we've got our cis face here and our trans face here. And if we're going to go towards the nucleus this way, so the nucleus is over here, and towards the cell membrane, it's got this little arrow going over here. So usually you're going to head from the nucleus through the ER into the Golgi because you need to modify it. Now, your proteins don't necessarily have to go through the Golgi, but oftentimes they're going to because I need to do some modifications. If I didn't tack on the correct functional groups onto my proteins within the endoplasmic reticulum, then maybe I need to do it in the Golgi apparatus, okay? So pretty cool you're going to move from the cyst to the trans side and then out to the cell membrane or wherever you're going, into a vesicle or whatever. Um, and so vesicles are is a term uh, which I'm about to talk about, uh, but vesicles, they're just any of these storage compartments that are phospholipid bilayers that just hold something for a while or serve a specific purpose to transport. That's usually what they're going to be used for. Um, sometimes specific vesicles are the end point, like uh, a peroxisome or a lysosome, but um, they're just small little storage units. Okay, So that's why I said vesicles that contain proteins or lipids enter the system. Okay, so they come in this way and then they leave. Cool. Uh, also have another picture from that same research group uh, where at Green they uh, took GFP and put giantin, which is a, sort of a Golgi marker-ish, and then they have the nucleus here, which they stained the histones, which are the proteins associated with the DNA uh, in red. Uh, so you can see uh, it's not as uh, ubiquitous as, say, the endoplasmic reticulum, but there is a ton of Golgi and it's spread all over the place. Because, I don't know, like, why would you just have Golgi on one side of the cell? Like, if I need to put stuff on the surface over here, then, you know, have some Golgi over there. Sure. Uh, something else uh, that I like about this picture, the histones are in red. Uh, you can see it's very dense around the outside edge here, okay? and then you see some darker areas here of histones. So the more red it is, the more histones there are, and that actually makes sense. So if we actually back up to the nucleus, you can remember heterochromatin is where it's really dense, and that's near the outside edges of the cell, or of the nucleus, sorry. And then you have your euchromatin or your loose chromatin where you're actually doing transcription within uh, a little deeper inside, and so you're gonna have less dense histones there. And that's what we're seeing here. So if I actually make all the histones red, they're less dense inside where the actual um, transcription process is happening. And then on the outside edge, towards the outside edge of the nucleus is where we have uh, more dense histones and where our chromatin is more dense, which is kind of fun. So moving on, vesicles. Vesicles are, like I said, just little phospholipid bilayers. Um, they kind of look like, like if you just took soap and you want to make like a lice, uh, a little cell. Uh, you can do that with just with soap. Any kind of phospholipid or any kind of lipid with a charged head will form these vesicles. Um, typically, we're using them to transport things um, either within the cell, uh, within cellular compartments, or extracellularly. So uh, neuronal synapses are driven by vesicle transport between the, the synapses uh, of neurons. And so that's also really important. So that's how, just one way that we move things out. Uh, they have tons of sizes and shapes and functions and different proteins. So you can have clathrin-coated vesicles, you can have copy-coated vesicles, um, and they just serve different purposes. That's kind of how you can tell, like, let's say I need to go to, uh, I want to send my vesicle to the lysosome, so I need to use clathrin. And I, but, oh, I want this one to actually go hang out near this mitochondria, so I'm going to use copy. I just completely made those up. But the idea of using different proteins to tell it different places to go definitely occurs inside the cell. Um, and so that's just a cool idea. Uh, vesicles come in all shapes and sizes. Like I said, um, they could be small, medium, large, giant, um, multi-lamellar, which basically they just have multiple lipid bilayers. So usually we think of, oh, it's just got a phospholipid bilayer. They almost just look like little mini cells. But they can have multiple bilayers, which is really kind of crazy. 
And I think this is actually a relatively old paper, uh, 2015, so that's five years old, so I'm sure there's a bunch more already. Uh, but anyway, vesicles, really interesting. There's two specific types of vesicles, uh, which you can argue if they actually fit what a vesicle is, if they're their own organelle or not. Doesn't matter. We're going to talk about them. Lysosomes and peroxisomes. So lysosomes, some people will, will call them the trash can, in quotes, of the cell. It's where you can send things either from outside the cell, so in this case, we're going to have follow the endosomal pathway, and it's going to take extracellular junk and head into a lysosome for degradation because they're full of enzymes. Uh, I didn't put a picture of it on here, but there's just lists of enzymes. Basically, if it's something biological and you can have an enzyme that cleaves it, that enzyme is going to be in a lysosome um, because you want to be able to break stuff down. So you can you know, have proteases, you're going to have lipases, you're going to have nucleic acid acids, um, like nucleases. Um, you can have uh, trigger destroying enzymes. My brain is just not working right now. Um, <laughs> so anyway, that's what's in there. Uh, you can go from outside, so you can gobble up stuff and chew it up. So like a macrophage would do that. Or if you need to degrade things from inside the cell, uh, we call that autophagy. So auto meaning you're like self. Um, and so if you have an autophagosome that you then you basically put like, uh, let's say I had a bunch of protein that I don't need anymore. Well, I stick an autophagosome, head it, send it into the lysosome, it gets chopped up, and then I can then break it down and use it to make more proteins. Um, and the actual signaling uh, and the feedback and all the interactions between the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell, what gets degraded, what doesn't get degraded, is a really, 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 really complex process. Uh, if you want to go to this article down here, it's a nature article. Um, uh, their pictures aren't the highest quality, that's why it looks a little little potato-y here, uh, but uh, these articles are really, really good for understanding more of the processes, because I'm drastically oversimplifying the functionality of most of these. I'm just kind of basically giving you what's the biggest functionality of this. It's to break stuff down, but they have other jobs too. Now, that's lysosomes, lice meaning to like cut or break. Um, peroxisomes... Uh, are where we have a ton of oxidation. So reduction versus oxidation, right? Reduction is the gaining of electrons, oxidation is the loss. Um, so when that occurs, we wanna keep that nice and controlled. Um, so when I actually wanna do some oxidizing, I can have a peroxisome, uh, which peroxide, which hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, is a byproduct of a, a lot of oxidation reactions. Okay? You're taking water and you're tacking an extra oxygen on which is fine. Yes, peroxide is toxic, okay, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. You could use it as a weapon. You could use it as a catalyst for other oxidation reactions. And so that's what we see inside of our peroxisome. So peroxisomes are named because they actually have peroxide as a byproduct. That's where their name came from, but they do tons of other stuff. Uh, tons of oxidation reactions, especially of fatty acids. So a lot of times the process is the the processes that occur within a peroxisome actually fall under the, the precursors of um, actually generating um, metabolically energy. And so if I want to, uh, if I want to take a, a glucose molecule, break it down in a side of a mitochondria and generate energy, awesome. Pretty straightforward. I don't need a peroxisome for that. But if I want to take like a fat, like a fatty acid, or maybe some uh, piece of protein and I want to turn that into energy, then maybe I'm going to have to go through a peroxisome because that's where I keep my enzymes that actually initiate those initial oxidation steps to actually start cutting things and start breaking these molecules down. That's where I keep them stored, is inside of a peroxisome. Okay. Uh, other things as well, I mean, you can make reactive oxygen species. That's what ROS stands for. Um, you generate bile acid. Um, so it just all kinds of stuff happens inside of a peroxisome. Well, look how comp this is an oversimplified diagram, and it's still really complicated. So uh, they're really complicated. You can click on this link down here, and it will take you to more about it. Now we've slowly been, you know, moving out from a cell. So we started at the nucleus, we moved on our way out. We hit some lysosomes, peroxisomes, and now we're actually almost to our cell membrane. Cell membranes are really, really complex places, <laughs> as you can see from this diagram, which is has been like copied and stolen and redone by so many different people. So you, you see this typical style a lot. This is a normal how, way that we actually show the um, typical structure of a 
cell membrane, though. Uh, so the inside versus the outside. Um, I wanted to emphasize here, I don't have a separate slide for the actual cytoskeleton, uh, but just it's very complex. Um, the actual structure of this is so complex that you need a whole course. You can have entire courses based just sure, purely on cell membranes and cell cytoskeletons and things like that. Uh, if you take a cell biology course, you can focus on it more. Uh, but things I wanted to emphasize that is that there is some structure to it. Um, the fluid mosaic model is typically how we still think about it. There are other models for how things actually move around within here. The way I like to think about it is um, if this is a pool, okay, so you've got these fossil lipids um, floating around in a pool and uh, the you've got your hydrophilic chains here and you get your hy hydrophobic heads, that's the red part. Um, those are kind of, they're like beach balls with um, strings hanging down and the strings like to be in the water and the beach balls don't and they're floating around and so you've got this big layer of beach balls and if you take like a big old giant I don't know like a boat and put it in there then it's gonna kind of float around it can still move around so it can the boat can move around within those beach balls the beach balls don't hold it in place or if you don't want to do beach balls like big chunks of ice or something those beach balls can move around it they're still fluid but the boat is still going to still be in its own spot, okay? It can still move around within. And so that's where we see the, the fluid mosaic model. Now, the other models are interesting, but honestly, the fluid mosaic is the best one for like a basic biochemistry course to understand. Uh, if you wanna start getting to fluid physics and like all the hardcore physics behind cell membranes, you go for it. We're not talking about it in this class, especially not today. Um, it's super dynamic, that's really important. Oh, and see the cholesterol? What's cholesterol? Uh, it depends on the kind of creature you are. If it's cholesterols, um, like uh, funguses have their own. They have like, uh, what is that? Sphingoesterols? I can't remember. Anyway, different types of cholesterols. Uh, anyway, those help keep it fluid. Uh, this is an under, this is oversimplified. Uh, we actually have uh, sometimes a one to one to one to two ratio of cholesterol to phospholipid. Um, so there should be way more cholesterol in here. Uh, that's one reason you need to eat fats. Good fats are good for you. All right, moving on. The last two organelles is, that I wanted to hit are chloroplasts. So you may know that in plants, they have chloroplasts, which part of what is inside the chloroplast is what actually makes plants green. And it's the chlorophyll within uh, the actual chloroplast itself within the thylakoids. And so it's a multi-membrane organelle, so it has two fossil bilayers, sort of like how a nucleus does, but usually we see more space between them. So, uh, sorry, so you got your chloroplast here, and then you've got these uh, thylakoids that actually have their own fossil uh, in between. And what's going to occur there is they take sunlight, okay, so it uses sunlight as the energy, it takes carbon dioxide and water, which is why plants need carbon dioxide and why you have to water them. And then it takes sunlight and uses that to basically smash those carbons together and make sugar. And as a byproduct, you also get oxygen. Sweet. There's your chloroplast. Um, they have, uh, they're very complicated processes. This actually comes from a really good nature article if you want to read more about chloroplasts. Uh, we will talk a little bit more about chloroplasts um, because they have their own electron transport chain. But this is talking about how to get proteins physically into the chloroplast, which is really interesting. So you can read that if you'd like. Uh, but yeah, chloroplasts, two membranes. Mitochondria is actually what we're going to focus on more in this biochemistry course, because within the mitochondria are, at least over here, are a ton of the energy metabolism pathways that we actually talk about in biochemistry. Uh, so when you're thinking citric acid cycle, that's going to occur in here. Okay? That's a TCA, tricarboxylic acid cycle, citric acid, same idea. Uh, the electron transport chain, where we actually make ATP by generating a hydrogen gradient, that occurs between these two spaces here, between the matrix and the intermembrane space. Um, so, so many, not just catabolic, but anabolic pathways occur within the nucleus. So, <laughs> this article talks more about all the different processes that can occur inside of, an, uh, of a mitochondria. We're honestly going to focus mostly on this section right here, if you take a cell bio course, we'll focus more on this. You can have entire courses based just on the mitochondria itself. Anyway, really, really cool. It's the key organelle for energy metabolism. We'll talk more about it later, at a later date, mostly in the last three lectures of this course.